You never see a leader getting up there on their platform with PowerPoint and lots of data and charts. It's not that they can't do it, it's that it actually gets in the way of them spreading their message. And instead, they tell stories in such ways that people relate to them. Historically, people who are able to make connections with their audiences tend to be quite successful at guiding people down a certain path and towards certain actions. I'm Patrick Pacheco, and you're listening to season four of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we guide you through the forces shaping your business inside and out. Today, let's start with a little exercise. What's something you learned about recently? Think about it. Is it a scientific finding, a fun fact, a historical event you'd never heard of, or simply something that stood out and caught your attention? Whatever it is, I bet there's a great story behind it. And that's not just instinct, it's science. When presented with facts and figures alone, research shows that most people only retain 5 to 10% of the information they're given. But take that data, fold it into a story, and the same people will remember 70% of it. So storytelling, it's a very powerful thing. And according to today's guest, it can change the way we do business. My name is Esther Choi, and I am the founder, CEO, and the chief story facilitator for a company called Leadership Story Lab. Esther knows her way around a good story. Since 2010, she's been teaching companies how to build their own business narrative. Through her firm, she connects clients with their audiences across a range of industries, including healthcare, tech, and even manufacturing. In today's episode, you'll learn how to find stories in every corner of your business and what to do with that great material. But before we dive in, let's make sure we're clear on our terms. I don't know about you, but I've never met a chief story facilitator before. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I am pretty decent in my storytelling craft, but the emphasis isn't about me and delighting everyone with my stories or telling my stories, the central role um, is about facilitating others, either individually or as a group, to find and source the best story ideas they could find, refine it and tell it in such a ways that is most convincing and persuasive to their intended audience. Interesting. So since we're talking about leadership stories here, what is your leadership story? (laughs) Uh, Well, my leadership story involves uh, roughly three stages. And first stage is making sense. The second stage is making the complex clear. And the third stage is making the connections. I was once a admissions officer at a very, very uh, prestigious competitive business school. University of Chicago, to be uh, specific. And it's uh, really a lot of work to decide out of the many, many, many qualified applicants every year who apply to the schools, a fraction of them got to be admitted. And I had the pleasure with my colleagues for a couple of years to offer denied feedback. And that makes no sense to me. Not only because it's an awkward conversation, it's after the fact, but what uh, really didn't make sense to me was why are there so many people who are so out of the world qualified and didn't get in? So I eventually realized that in a competitive environment, having the right qualifications is just first half of it. The second half is actually telling your stories in such a way that would resonate with gatekeeper and decision maker because they're making decisions in the presence, but for the future. And that goes for other competitive environments, whether you're asking for money, asking for a job, asking for people's vote, uh, whatever that may be is making sense. The part about making the complex clear is just the fact of life that we are experts in very, very specific area, but In order for us to move forward, we have to speak to a wide range of people who don't have our expertise. And so what people don't know seem very complex, but it seems very obvious to us. 
So how do we tell stories to people who don't have that kind of expertise, but in a way that makes it clear to them? And then finally, making the connections. And that is, I tend to ask people just questions that, what is the difference between proving and persuading? What do you think, Patrick? So if I'm proving, I'm trying to get to an absolute. I'm trying to show that this is this triangle is a triangle because I can show you exactly why it's a triangle and you can't you can't repeat that. Persuading would be much more of of a getting people to believe that it's a triangle without necessarily having to show them absolute proof. I I, I would think that'd be one way I would define it. Yeah, exactly. So proving is showing that what you have to show is in the relative or absolute sense, the most correct or the best out there uh, using data, information, facts, arguments, logics, analysis, whatever tools is at your disposal. But persuading is getting people to believe and to act. But throughout history, we've seen endless examples of people having been persuaded to do all sorts of things without much of any proof. And so the third stage of my story, making the connection that has a lot to do with persuasion is that unless we establish the personal connection with our audience, then the persuasion is very, very difficult to achieve. Long story short, you'll need to be relatable to hook your public's attention. But that's not all. A good business story is seamless. It draws you in without you even noticing. I think it's interesting that most people don't notice how pervasive storytelling is. I like to quote David Foster Wallace, that fish don't see water. And the more pervasive something is, the less we're able to see them. There are certainly storytellings on stage, storytelling at your local bar, open mic night. And there are other purposes of telling stories, such as entertainment, such as um, self-actualizations. But leaders tell stories. You never see a leader getting up there on their platform with PowerPoint and lots of data and lots of charts. It's not that they can't do it, it's that they don't need to do it. It's that it actually gets in the way of them spreading their message. And instead, they tell stories in such ways that people relate to them. You know, he's one of us or she's one of us. Historically, people who are able to make connections with their audiences tend to be quite successful at guiding people down a certain path and towards certain actions. And so there is an outcome There is a desirable path and um, leaders are very intentional about how to guide people down that path. That's interesting when you put it that way, because I think back to one of the one of the presidential elections and you had Ross Perot, who was very smart on economics, but he'd get up and he'd put up all these graphs and charts. And that's how he tried to campaign. And then you had Bill Clinton (laughs) that was just talking about a little town called Hope. And Bill was just much softer and you know, and, and just played on that leadership of hope, and it? He would just pull people in. So that's that is pretty helpful in, in explaining the importance of, of a leader being able to be a good storyteller. Yeah, so this relates back to how I started on this path, my leadership story, and that is leaders in general try to rely a bit too much on their credentials, on facts and data and figures. I have worked hard. I have gone through these accreditations or educations. I have been through various economic crises. I have been through certain budgetary crises and I've proven myself in other words. So there are a lot of information that one can, leaders can share, but what you're getting at with your earlier example between Perot and Clinton was that Folks, even the one who don't like President Clinton, don't agree with him if they have ever even attended one of his rallies. Inevitably, they felt like he's talking to me. There are thousands of people in in this auditorium. I felt like he's talking to me. I felt like I know him. 
And what they're really addressing and, and getting to is that I felt like I got to the I got to the core of this person. I know their character, and therefore I feel like I can trust them. And therefore I feel like what he ha- or she has to say rings truer in my mind and my heart. And so that is the very core and soul of telling a story is because you make the connection, you make the complex clear by putting your character out there front and center along with other facts and other information that your audience need to know, but that is not the number one thing. So another interesting thing, I, I'm pretty much an open book with folks at work. If I have a game, it's on my calendar. I, I used to coach, and if I would have to, my son now has a football game or something, I just put it on my calendar. Pretty open book about everything. But I talked to some of the leaders, and they said, well, you know, it's good to show your humanity, but you got to be careful because, you know, don't look too vulnerable because then people won't respect you or they'll, you know, start to try to pick on some issue they see. How do you balance vulnerability as a leader? You got to be the boss and you don't want to lose that, but you also want people to know that you're, you're human. And it seems like storytelling would be a good way to, to, to do that. Yeah, I'm so glad you um, bring that up because that word has been popularized for almost over a decade now, and with good reasons, because we want to work with leaders, we can relate to, we respect, that we feel like we know their characters. And showing vulnerability is one way to do it. I think the tricky part about that is not everybody has the same definition of what vulnerability is. I know you have a guest several episodes back talk about culture. And I love the way it began because he said, if you ask five people uh, what their definition of culture is, you'll get 55 different (laughs) answers. Mm -hmm. And maybe vulnerability doesn't yield you that many, but I can bet you that if you ask people what does it mean, uh, you get very different ideas. Um, But if we don't even know what it means, then how can we do it, right? And so I think vulnerability, you allude to that earlier, Patrick, is showing your humanity. It is also something that you can think of as something personal about me, but this is not private. So that's a usually a rule of thumb that I would encourage clients to think about is what is personal but not private. And further, out of something that's personal, what can we glean and discern from this about who you are potentially as a leader? So I begin every Mondays with a thousand meter swim and the raw jalapeno. That is something personal, but is not private. And from here, I have stories, many stories that people can glean in from my character. So some people think of vulnerability as weakness, as a time where you fail miserably. It can be that, but then we don't want it to be standing direct in conflict of your own leadership voice. Life is full of financial decisions. We've got the products, services, and people to help make them easier. Stop by a branch or visit us online at cadencebank.com to find out why Cadence is the bank for you. Cadence Bank, member FDIC. I mean, we're talking about the art of storytelling, but is there a science to it as well? I mean, there's things you can do that trigger certain acts just because you're, you're doing them a certain way? Yeah, absolutely. The science behind it is that when we hear story, it's not just a language processing part of our brain. For example, Patrick, if you were to tell me that, hey, Esther, I am actually a semi-professional soccer player. I don't know if you are. I'm just making that up. But if you were to and you're trying to describe a game you were in and you're trying to describe a particular corner kick and I'm listening to it, it's not just that I decode what you're saying to me through words and language, but in the part of my brain that also activate actions that control my motions, such as walking and running and kicking, all of those regions of the brain will be activated as well. So story listening, storytelling is a whole brain experience. 
And that's why people tend to remember stories, even if they don't remember when and where they heard the story from. The science checks out. Our brains are wired to engage with stories. Having said that, there's still magic to a good tale, don't you think? There's intrigue, suspense, turning points, and a resolution that lands just right. So how do you make that happen? Well, it's not witchcraft. The first order of business is what is your story really about? I would challenge everyone after listening to this podcast, start listening to how other people tell their stories. I would say six or seven out of 10 times they are recounting facts with this unspoken assumptions that the more details, the more information and perhaps data I can include, the more persuasive I become when um, it's actually just the opposite. We have to first go to the conceptual core of the story. That would help us decide what details are relevant and what's not. And with that, then we'll have a very sharp pair of scissors to cut out all the excess details. Because we have to keep in mind that people's memories are terrible. And it's not because of aging or it's not because of innate ability. It's just that it's a scientific fact that humans' memories are incredibly unreliable. We remember very little to begin with. And so with that in mind, it can sound kind of discouraging, um, but actually I think it's very liberating because people don't remember much anyway, but they do remember something, even if it's a little bit. So the chance that we have here is to be very, very disciplined and very, very focused on what is that little bit that I want my audience to remember and put all your storytelling firepower behind that. Hmm. You've written that the secret to a great story is, is IRS. And I assume you're not talking about the Internal Revenue Service. Because <laughs> I can't think of them being a good, a good story in, in any possible way. So what do you mean by IRS and storytelling? Yes, IRS is a structure, a way of structuring our story. Whether we are writing an email, whether we're opening up a pitch, and whether we are writing a screenplay for a movie, the structure of a story stays eternally the same. And IRS stands for I, intriguing beginning. R stands for riveting middle. And S stands for satisfying end. So intriguing beginning, riveting middle, and satisfying end. Those are the three parts of a story that regardless of how long, how short, in what format, through what medium, are exactly following this flow. How many times have we been to a meeting, in person or virtual, where at the end of it, we wonder, even if quietly to ourselves, well, what was the point of that? Or why was I in that meeting? and or any one number of similar questions along that line. And if people ever left a meeting feeling that way, it's because there was no sense of closure. There's no sense of conclusion. And so a good story would have a satisfying end in that either they, one, learn something new they otherwise wouldn't have, or number two, they might have not learned something new, but their perspective, their point of view on the topic have been elevated. Or number three, that they know exactly what to do. Maybe not all three, but at least one of the three. So they learn something new, their point of view has been elevated, or they know exactly what to do. Building a story, the structure the integrity of the structure is everything, and that doesn't even take creativity. And so once you know that, and once you practice a little bit with it, then you'll see that is really, it's a guardrail as well as a template to follow. To be a good storyteller, you don't need innate creative talent. You just want a method, but a little inspiration can help too. 
I encourage everybody to go collect stories because if you want to become a great storyteller, you also first actually have to become a great story collector. So go and collect lots of stories, listen to lots of stories, good and bad. And I do mean it, good and bad. The good one, we want to reverse engineer it and really dissect it, break it down and trying to understand, well, I was drawn to it from the very beginning. How did they do that? So same thing with bad stories, stories that don't resonate with you, stories that are boring, break it down and analyze it and ask yourself, they lost me from the very beginning, or I was really into it and then I just completely lost interest. Well, at which point did you lose interest? And what was said right before, during and after that lose you until the very end? And why did they gain your interest back at the very end? So reverse engineer it and then look for feedback. There's no other way to actually test how effective our stories are until we get feedback from people. And always practice intriguing beginning, riveting middle and satisfying. And that takes no muse, no inspiration, no creativity to master it. <laughs> That means everybody has some hope. <laughs> I do believe it. That is the case after having done it for 14 years. Personal stories connect us on a deeper level and bring our company's values to the forefront. But what does that mean in practice? Well, after talking the talk, it's time to tell the tale. Plot twist, we swapped roles. And Esther started asking the questions. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say... You coach clients to create compelling leadership stories. So what about, what if we do a little role play here and, and maybe you kind of go in a, a abbreviated process with me? I am so glad you suggest <laughs> that, Patrick. <laughs> After all, storytelling is also about showing, not telling, right? So, so far we've been doing a lot of storytelling and let me show everyone how the process of developing a story can work. So what if I walk you through a part of this exercise that uh, we do in our training? It can be done in a big group or individually. And I will walk you through it first, and then I'll explain what we just did together. Would that be okay? Sure. Sounds great. Okay. So we're going to play three rounds of games here. Okay. Okay. So number one, can you pick a random number, Patrick, between 1 and 20? 13. All right. Thank you. Um, Patrick, we have this list of 20 questions, and uh, you just picked number 13 on our list of 20. And question number 13 is, what do you do when you're not working? I build things, whether it's... Uh, in the yard, you know, doing gardening or something like that. I also build furniture. I do a lot of kind of art type pieces. I like to do things with my hands. I could do anything at all. I, I would do something if I use my hands. Wow. How long have you been doing gardening, furnitures, art pieces? So, uh, since way back in high school, college, um, I made a big table that had the tile like a Madrian painting that I, that I used in law school and undergrad. I've always made things. I came in second in the bridge building contest at UT Arlington when they had it when I was high school. So I've always wanted, I always liked doing things with my hands. Wow. Did you say you won second place of bridge building? Bridge building. You had to, you like had actual to, bridge? Yeah, you had to build a bridge, this little small balsa wood bridge, and then they loaded it and it, they figured out how much, how much it, force it took before it failed. And I think the other guy cheated because he just glued all his pieces together <laughs> in just one flat thing. <laughs> And that, and he beat me by like a two, two pounds of pressure, but it was it, oh. it was pretty interesting. I, and I made mine look like a railroad bridge. So, wow, wow, impressive! Especially given what you do for work and what you do for fun, this is extra impressive. All right, so that's round one. Let's do round two. And uh, round two, I just like you to select one question of the twenty that's not thirteen. And one that you wish you could answer, but for round one, but you didn't. Uh, how about what is one of the best things you have done just because you're told you can't? Ooh, I love that one. Yes, yes, please. So I guess I was always a kid that would speak up in class, or if I didn't like something, or if I, you know, if, I, if somebody was 
one to argue. I, I was never much one that's to step away from it. And I can remember, and my parents always encouraged me in everything, but the one thing that they would tell me occasionally is you need to, you, you got to kind of play the game. You know, I, I guess everybody kind of plays the game to some extent, but I'm pretty blunt and pretty straightforward about things and not, not to try to do it in a mean way. And I felt that you could get there by not necessarily having to quote, play the game. And, and I think I've done pretty well. Maybe I've held myself back here or there, but but all in all, I'm, I'm, I've always walked away happy with, with the fact that I, I was true to me. Can you think of a time or example where you speak up that kind of landed you in, a, in hot water? It's hard to even pick a, a single one because it seems like it happens every other day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one. That, so I worked for a law firm and at 9-11, uh, we were in a meeting and the assistant came in one time and said, your spouse is on the phone, I want to talk to you. And she said, I want you out of that building now. I couldn't figure out what's going on. We walked outside, turned out 9 11 was occurring. And the lawyers there, I was just an associate at the firm, but they said, oh, well, it's, everything's going to be fine. You know, we're, we're, we're just going to just need to go along with our day. That's over in New York. Why are, we, why are we worried? And I said, well, because we're in the tallest building west of the Mississippi River and you don't know where every plane is at. And I said, I just kind of stood, I kind of stepped up and I said, you know, people are scared. They're not sure what's happening. We don't know what's happening. There's planes that are potentially missing. You need to let everybody go home. And I said, I'm going home and you need to let everybody go home. And I just picked up my stuff and I walked out and they were, I could tell they were a little irritated because they lost a day of work. But just to me, it was just, I couldn't believe they were saying, let's all stay here and, and everything will be fine. So, and I, yeah, I think I was kind of showing them up a little bit, but yeah, I was just, I was just thought people needed to be safe. So that's what I did. But no, well, nothing happened in the building. So I don't think we, but they could have, you know, you know. But they could have, but that's what, you didn't know that at the time, the extent of the attack. So Wow, thank you. All right, that's round two. The last round is question number 20. What's one path you did not travel and why not? When I went to school, I was going to be a biomedical engineer and I was going to go to med school. And I guess I, why not? I, I, mean, I remember I got my first engineering physics exam and I had a 36 and the guy that sat next to me said, dude, you, you killed it. I had a, I had a four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so with the curve, I think I ended up with a B minus, but I thought, boy, this is, I don't know if this is exactly what I want to do. And then you'd go do some things where you'd meet with doctors and, and they, so more and more of them seemed to be kept me less and less happy with the practice just because of the way managed medicine was going. And so I, I decided I wasn't going to be a doctor and uh, ended up being an economics major than a lawyer. So. Mm, okay. All right. So that concludes part one, and now's the part two. Patrick, you and I just met, but I would propose that based on what you just share with me out of these three questions, I think I can do you a solid and tell a story about you just by having these informations, also following a particular storytelling structure. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to take a crack at it with my homework and having just heard a little bit about you. Let's say, Patrick, I'm about to introduce you at an industry conference and then you are one of the panel speakers. Okay. In this day and age where at times that seems like there will be no end to interest rates rising, where the world seems to be descending into further chaos. If you're thinking about where is the best place where I can seek best advice as well as management of my asset, you would think, well, a group of people who really know investment. Well, true enough, but I would argue that the best place to be is where people will give it to you straight whether it's something you want to hear or not. And this I find in my new friend and colleague, Patrick Pacheco. You see, he was sitting in a room as a young associate and understanding what had happened on the morning of September 11, 2001, but not near the actual target site. He found out early enough that Everyone needs to stop, drop what they're doing right there, right then, and go somewhere to seek safety. People were annoyed. 
We're not even in New York. Why are we worrying about that? Who is this young upstart who tell us what to do, how to do it, and does he think he know better? Well, yes, he does, because at that time nobody knew the extent of the attack, and so the right thing, even if it's the unpopular thing to do, is to go to somewhere safe, disperse, and don't concentrate so many people in one single building, and that's Patrick. He is someone who speaks his mind, even if it's not the most popular and most well received. And don't we all want to partner with someone who has that kind of conviction and integrity? And if I have another hour with Patrick, which I know I don't, but if I were to have another hour with Patrick, I would love to know and understand how he balances work. Which is very intellectually intensive, with building everything from artwork to furniture pieces to bridge, with his own hands. I, I thought that was very good. That's not bad for having no time to craft it and having just met you and asked you these three questions. And imagine if I had a little bit more time, I think I could do even better. I got lucky that you picked the second question you chose. And said that you speak up, but one thing that I did push for is a specific example to get to know your character, get to know who you are. And so, in storytelling, is the what is in the specific that reflects the universal. I have a certain basis of information about you, but more importantly, I have a conceptual core. That I choose for the story about you, and that's that Patrick speaks his mind, even if it's unpopular, and with the emotional underpinning of the story. What I hope to get to is inspire a sense of trust as they get to know you, and because that's the story I'm trying to write for you, that's what I understand as who you are. With Esther today, you got to hear a little about me. But hopefully, you learned a lot more about leadership storytelling. Stories will help your clients understand your company. But for a narrative to be compelling, it needs to resonate. Emotion yields persuasion. So be relatable. Make your story human, and it will stay with your audience. Ask yourself, what is this story really about? What are the key details? There's only so much information we can hold on to. So be selective. Tell us why this story matters. Tell us what you've learned. Remember to use IRS: intriguing beginning, riveting middle, satisfying end. That's how the story goes. Look at the business stories you loved, and unpack those you didn't enjoy. As you learn what works and what doesn't, you'll find your own narrative voice. Last but not least, believe in your own material, because we all have stories to tell. At every single training, doesn't matter how many people, I always get at least one, at least one person, who tells me they have no story. So,、um, to that, I would say,、um, if you have lived lives, then you have plenty of stories. I think a lot of people subconsciously assume that a story is an epic story. That means the heroic one. That means you're the one who invented the next vaccine for the next pandemic, or that you're the next Google co-founder. But no, a story just simply implies that someone has faced a challenge, overcome that challenge, and they are changed for the better because of it. It's another way to look back at, holy cow! Look at how many challenges I have overcome, and more importantly, how much I can impact others when I tell my stories well. I'd like to thank Esther Choi for bringing stories to life with us today, and also for making me sound much more compelling than I am. If you'd like to read a developed script of introduction, just browse the show notes. As for us, we'll be back next week with a business tale proudly brewed in Macon, Georgia. But that's a story for another time. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Sheena Cochran, Edie Pingeli, and Natalie Barron. Our executive producer is Danielle Cornell. 
This podcast is made in collaboration with the team at Lower Street. Writing and production from Andrew Gannam and Lise Lavati. Sound design and mixing by Ben Cramp. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matters discussed in the podcast and are based on their own perspectives. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies in which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expression of any opinion on part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.